Well, Element Church fam, it is an awesome opportunity for us to lean into God's word together today. And before we jump into the Bible, I just want to uh, give a little analogy about where we are as a church. You've obviously already heard a little bit as we introed out today, but this right here is actually for you, the Element Church family. And this is such an exciting day uh, because this is just for you, specifically made for you. And here at Element Church, we are doing a little bit of what we're calling a remodel um, here in the fall because in a remodel, your foundation is still there. The main structure of the house is still there, but you are changing some of the interior in such a way that it will serve your family better up the road. And while you're in the remodel process, there's a couple of things that happen. Um, one is you're limiting what's available to you inside the house during the remodel. So if you're remodeling a kitchen, you're not cooking all of your own meals. You're probably ordering pizza or to Chinese takeout or something uh, or Grubhub or w whatever. And it, you're eating something, it's a little bit different. Um, it's a limited version of what you're going to be doing, but it's limited for a purpose. And the purpose is that you're going somewhere and it is setting you up for your future. And so that's it. Another thing is it's a little bit inconvenient. And so uh, even as we transition into creating this for you, our Element Church family online specifically, thanks for your grace as you continue to roll with us as we are remodeling a bit. And uh, thank you for that. Um, so we're really excited to do that with you. Thanks for for hanging with us, and we're going to continue to be here with you on the weekends online. So let me jump into our teaching for today. We are starting a new series called dun -da -da -da, Remodel. As you can imagine, that's a fitting term for us. And we are talking about remodeling in general, but we're also talking about remodeling in our own personal lives. And we will be talking about that as we move into this today. I uh, remember I read a quote a couple weeks ago from C.S. Lewis, and I'm, I'll paraphrase it for you, but he basically said this. He said, we understand our relationship with God. Uh, we, we, we take our house to him and he starts to fix up the obvious things like a linky, uh, linky, a leaky faucet, or maybe there's a hole in the roof and he starts to fix those things up. And we understand that. But then he starts to knock down walls. He starts to do remodeling. And we don't understand because we think that he's supposed to fix our little house. And what we don't realize is that he's remodeling us into a palace, one at which he's going to be very well at home. And so as we think about that idea, we move toward God's word today. And this week in week one, what I want to talk to us about as part of our foundational understanding as we're remodeling here is this idea of be before do. So it's be, be, not like a bumblebee, be, that's identity before do. And um, I want to give you three words today, and then I want to tell you a story as we launch in, but there's three words. There is, there is pleasure, there's purpose, and then there's relationship. And write those down. If you've got your notes, those will come in very handy today. I wanted to start out, um, years ago I was in Chicago, and I was in McCormick uh, Place. It's kind of the big convention center in Chicago. And I was actually meeting my dad there. He was already in Chicago, and I had actually driven in, and I got to the hotel, and then I got over, got in my suit and everything. It was a convention there for the National Restaurant Association. And I went into McCormick Place, and it's this huge place, and I'm literally texting with my dad. I think I was even on the phone with him at one point, and I was trying to find my father. And I, I, I kept I kept reaching out to him like, hey, where do I go? What do I do? And he kept telling me, hey, do you see this? Do you see that? And there was one point where we actually were talking about a banner. He was like, do you see the banner that says, and I was like, and I was looking at it. And then he started giving me directions. And what was funny is that there was actually two banners that were identical. And he was looking at one and I was looking at another one in an entirely different place. So as I was following the instructions from my father, I ended up into a place where I, I couldn't go anymore. There were security guards and I was at a dead end. And the thing that was interesting is my father was giving me good directions, but because of my starting place, I had a different starting place. I ended up in a dead end instead of finding my father. And I think for a lot of us, as we move into this idea here today, that a lot of us are trying to follow the Bible. We're trying to listen to God. We're trying to maybe find that purpose instead of pleasure, or maybe we're in in purpose and we're trying to find pleasure and we're, we're doing everything we know how to do, but, but we, we, we have a misappropriated starting place. And so instead of finding our father, we actually wind up in dead ends and we wind up in all sorts of dead ends because we have the wrong starting places. Um, many of us have emotional, mental, or spiritual starting places that eventually lead us to emotional, mental, or spiritual dead ends. And so today, what I want to do as we start into this series, and as we start into a new season of Element Church, is I want to take us back to the beginning. I want to take us back to the foundation of a remodeled house. 
And I want to talk to us today about our starting places. And I want to ask you a question. And the question is this, what is your starting place? What is your lens for the world? For some of us, um, it might be a religion. It might be, you might be watching this today. You're like, I don't even know how I'm watching this. I, I'm not a Christian. I'm not even interested in Christianity. I'm, and then insert faith system here. You, you know, you're like, I, I'm this or I'm that. Um, maybe we come from a religious worldview. Or maybe for some of us, we, we're like, I don't like religion at all. I don't like any of that stuff. I am a self-made person. Maybe you're a humanist. Maybe you're a secularist. Uh, maybe you're an atheist. Maybe you're an agnostic. But whatever it is, you're like, hey, I'm self-sufficient. Um, I don't need any, any of this religious stuff. Maybe it's some combination of your own creating. Whatever it is, your starting place matters. And I hope that you'll listen for the next few moments because I want to give you a starting place that's ancient and a starting place that's well-tested and a starting place that leads us to find a good father, which ultimately fulfills our desire for pleasure and for purpose. So ultimately, um, we want to find our father and we want to experience those things together. So we've got to find the proper starting place. And you know what? In an airport or a mall, it's a map and it says you are here. On uh, Google Maps, it says uh, this is enabling location services so it can find you. Um, in a remodel, it's called your foundation. It's like, I am here. I'm starting here. So in the Bible, we actually have this really powerful, deep, and, and, and succinct story uh, parable from Luke chapter 15. So if you have your Bible, open it up. If you don't, go ahead. You can, If you're online, you can open a, a browser or whatever. Uh, if you have your phone, you can actually download the Element app, or you can download a uh, Bible Gateway app or, or whatever you might uh, have. But get your Bible out and read along with me. And I want to turn us to Luke 15. Let me set the, the stage and the story for us quickly. Jesus is actually talking to people, and there's these um, religious people that start to come around him. The, the Bible calls them the Pharisees, which are the religious people of the day, and the teachers of the law. Those are religious people of the day. In other settings, Jesus has other people that come around and chide him and mock him or whatever. Um, but in this uh, location here in Luke 15, let me read the first couple of verses. Um, verse 1, Luke 15, verse 1. It says, Now the tax collectors and sinners... We're gathering around to hear Jesus. These are people that are trying to find their starting po point. These are people that are trying to lay a good foundation. They're trying to get enable, they're trying to enable their location services. Verse two, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, they're complaining, this man, Jesus, welcomes sinners and eats with them. And then in response to that, Jesus tells them this parable. And there's actually a series of three parables, and they all work together. I'm not going to read all of them for us. I will read the third one in totality. But the first parable is verse 4 through 7. It's actually about 100 sheep. And uh, Jesus uses the parable of a farmer who loses one of his 100 sheep. And it says, doesn't he go in search of the one sheep to go find the one sheep? And he leaves the 99 behind. And that's this parable. And then it says he finds the sheep. He returns back with his lost sheep sheep and he rejoices with all of his friends in their celebration. The next parable that Jesus tells is about 10 coins that um, one is lost and there's a person who searches all through the home and she finds the one coin that she lost and she calls her friends and they all celebrate together. This is Luke 15 verse 8 through 10. And then taking this idea of a lost sheep, which obviously has value, but it's a sheep. And then a lost coin, which obviously has value, but it's a coin. Jesus rolls the attention of everyone listening into this idea of a family. And he starts to tell a parable or a story about a lost son, which is obviously more valuable than a sheep or a coin. In Luke 15, 11, it says this, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. And here's, as we launch into this, what I want to show you right off the bat is that the two sons represent these ideas. One is um, the idea of pleasure. And then the other son represents the idea of purpose. And I'll show you how those actually get built out here in the scripture. And then we're invited to, to learn a lesson from either son, because we all have the capacity to be either son. And we all have the capacity to start in the wrong place and miss our father. So Luke 15, and I'll uh, continue on here into verse 12. So Jesus is telling the story. There's a man who has two sons. I'm going to read um, four verses here for us. It says this, the younger son said to the father, father, give me my share of the estate. So the father divided the property between his sons. Um, not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, and he set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country and, be, and he began to be in need. Verse 15. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, the distant country, who sent him to his field to feed pigs. Verse 16, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating 
but no one gave him anything. So if you're taking notes, the first point here today, the first idea, the first lens, the first starting point is this. It's, it's what I will call the rebellious self-seeker. And really this gets built out as we are seeking satisfaction or pleasure through rebelling against traditional rules, and we do that by self-discovery. Now, this is actually, I believe, sits at the at the bottom of our culture as, as Americans, a Western culture. We love this idea. We love this idea that we're self-sufficient. We love this idea that it's it's holding up the value of the individual. And there's truth and there's value in that. But we take that all the way to the nth degree, and we love that idea. Um, we, we start to think about this concept of... Um, I don't want to be controlled. I don't want to be limited. Um, I want what I want. I'm in control. I want what's mine. I do what I want to do. I, I follow my heart. I pursue my dreams. And this thing comes out where we actually begin to follow and chase pleasure through self-sufficiency and self-seeking. I sometimes call it the gospel of Disney because it's like the storyline of all of the Disney shows um, all the time. And here's the error that the younger son makes. He thinks he will be happier if he chucks the traditional rules of his father's house and he goes in search of his own pleasure and desires in a faraway country. Again, the idea that the Bible's giving us is outside, out from under the rules of tradition, out from under the rules of any sort of religious structure. We might call it in this lens, we might call it dogma. Um, we're, we, man, we don't need that anymore. We've outgrown religion. We've outgrown all of that. That's, that's archaic stuff. We know best now. And the error that the son makes, he actually goes to the father and he says this. He says, give me what's mine and then he got together all that he had, and then he went into a new place, a faraway distant country outside of the rules of his father's house, and he lived according to his own desires. It says that he squandered all that he had in, in wild living. He, he just lived it up. Anything that his heart desired, he did not deny himself. He went all after it, and he went out. And what's fascinating with the, the message from this story that's been waiting for us for thousands of years is that when we do that, when the younger son did that, and when we do that, and you do that, I'm sure, and I do it also, that what we're left with is we are left with running out of, uh, of we are, he, he ran out of all of his money, and he found himself in a desperate situation. And I want to keep um, reading the scripture um, uh, here. It says, verse 16, as we read, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And so where he winds up is he spends all that he has and he winds up feeding pigs as a hired servant and no one's giving him anything. And he's longing to eat what the pigs are eating. And so we find ourselves in a low spot. And I don't know if you've ever been there. I don't know if you've ever been in this younger son situation. I have where we have pursued our desires. And what has happened is it's left us in a place where we are feeding something. Because if you go back into the historical context of this, Jewish people did not eat pigs. Pigs were unclean to a Jewish culture. So feeding pigs would have been the lowest of the low experience for someone like this. And it says he longed to fill his stomach with the pods the pigs were eating. He would never eat a pig. Now, of course, the, the farmer in this faraway land is farming pigs, but the Jewish boy would never eat pigs. And so he's, in a sense, he's feeding something that will never feed him. He has pursued pleasure through self-sufficiency and self-seeking. And where he's wound up is that he has spent everything that he's got and he's feeding something that will never feed him. Now, I don't know if you can follow the parallels of this, but I know in my life, when I have pursued, blindly pursued my own pleasure and my own self-sufficiency, I always run myself to a point where I end up feeding something that never feeds me back. And you might be watching this today and you're like, Pastor Scott, that's me. I have been pursuing, and I've written down several here just as I was preparing and praying for you, honestly, in preparation of this. What are our pursuits? And for some of us, it, our pursuit might be control. It might be uh, money or career, but really, honestly, it's not just money or career. It's actually probably ultimately control. It's being able to put our hands on the wheel of our own life and be able to control what's happening. Um, it might be recognition. It might We might flesh that out in sports or a gift or talent that we have and making that an identity, but really, it's about recognition. We might be pursuing pleasure. It might be sex or it might be stimulants, but it's ultimately, it's about pleasure. We might, um, it might even be being a victim because there's a moral power to that or, or unforgiveness is a false sense of power of holding something over someone else's head, whatever it might be. But these idea of these pursuits 
And again, these self-sufficiency statements that we, that we do, that we chase, um, I can do this myself. I don't need anybody. Follow your heart. If you feel it, do it. Don't judge me. It's my truth. Be true to who you are. Don't let anyone tell you your value. You do you. YOLO. You only live once. Is that still a thing, by the way? Is YOLO even still a thing? I don't even know if that's still a thing. But there it is. And it is the acceptance of everything over the judgment of anything. We, we will not make rules. We will not succumb to rules. We will seek what we desire. And um, we are driven by that. And I will put this on your screen for you, but I wrote this in my notes this way. Seeking true satisfaction through self-seeking and self-sufficiency ends in us feeding things that will never feed us. So if you're feeding something today that will never feed you, if you are in a sexual relationship and you know it is not feeding you, if you are, um, if you've severed good relationships in your past, if you are in a foreign land and you are in a famine, you are spiritually and emotionally bankrupt, you've spent all you have and you've been riotously living, you've been pursuing what you pleasure and it has just left you empty and you are hungry, know that you have a home. Know that you have a spiritual home, and that's where we need to shift that lens, that we need to shift that you are here. We need to start from a different place, and if you say, Pastor Scott, that's me. I've been pursuing that pleasure. What do I do? Well, Jesus tells us here in the story exactly what to do, so we keep reading Luke 15, verse 17. It says, when the son came to his senses, so the younger son came to his senses, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. He's like, it's way better under my father's rules, back at my father's house. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against you and against heaven. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants, verse 20. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion of him or for him and ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. And in the Greek, if you read that, it's kissing him over and over and over again. It's this miraculous, beautiful kind of re, re, uh, restitution of relationship. It's, a, it's a, a regeneration of relationship. Verse 21, the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against you, against heaven. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Verse 22, but the father said to the servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and killed it. Let's have a feast and let's celebrate. For this son of mine, not a hired servant, the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He is lost and found and they began to celebrate. And if you are someone who has pursued pleasure, you've pursued self-sufficiency or self-seeking, and that's been your route and you've gone. Can I tell you something? If you are in a distant country and you feel hungry and you feel bankrupt and you've been feeding something you know will never satisfy you. Can I tell you that you have a home and you have a spiritual heavenly father who invites you to come back into relationship with him and he will receive you as a son or a daughter, period. That's a beautiful thing. Repentance is a gift, not a bad word. And uh, so if that's you, there it is. Now there's a second miss here and this leads us into our second point. But the second miss is that once you realize you've done something a miss, or you've done something wrong, or you've done something outside of the father's house, or you've, you've squandered the resources that you had, and you decide to return home, which is good, that repentance idea, you can make another error. And the error that the son actually starts making is he doesn't say, I'm going to go home and be a son. He says, I'm going to go home and I, I am no longer worthy to be to be a son of my father. So perhaps I can be a hired servant. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing the, the scripture here. I can earn my way back to pay off my debt. And here's what's fascinating. The mistake we make when oftentimes we're a younger son and we turn to go home is that instead of going home to receive a robe and sandals and a ring and a, and a celebration, we go home and prepared to work. And we enter into a meritocracy and we, are, we enter into trying to earn our way back into our place. And here's what's, what's crazy. He was never worthy to be a son. He was a son because he was a son. He never earned his way into being a son. He was born to be a son. And so what we need to do is as we go back home, here's my challenge to you is to not go back to work, but to go back to be a son or a daughter. It's not earning and paying off. It's going back and receiving grace. And that leads us to our second point. And there's a second son in the story. And the second son in the story, the older son, is not a a rebellious self-seeker. He's actually a religious rule keeper. 
which is actually what you start to do when you go back to earn your way, because then you try to relate with God the Father through rules and through keeping the rules and through earning your way. And what ends up happening, happening subtly is you begin to point your finger or look down your nose at other people, and you start to judge them, and you start to make assessment on them. And so number two is the, the religious rule keeper. And the religious rule keeper seeks satisfaction or purpose through religion, rule keeping, and gaining power through morality and sacrifice. It's, it's moralism. It's religion. And here's what's interesting is that there's, it, there, there's not a, a pursuit of pleasure in the same way, but there's a pursuit of purpose, but it's an over pursuit of purpose. It's like there's so much purpose that it becomes this religious obligation that you're doing to try to please God and what's fascinating is that the older son misses the father as much as the younger son. Check this out. Luke 15, Jesus continues the story, verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. So the younger son's coming home um, from this self-seeking. He comes back. It says the older son's in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and he asked him, what's going on? Your brother has come home, he replied, and your father's killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. Verse 28, the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you. Did you catch the language? I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you gave, uh, you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But this son of yours, he's like shaking his finger. This son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes and while living comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. Verse 31, my son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours, not son of mine, the brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. And here's what's fascinating is that when you uh, are not rebelliously self-seeking, but you are religiously rule-keeping, what it actually leads you to is it le leads you to bitterness and anger toward other people. And it leads you to accusation and anger toward actually eventually God himself. You, you, God, you owe me something. God, I've been doing the right things. God, I've been keeping all the rules. God, I've been in the field slaving, working for you. I've never disobeyed you. And you owe me something that you are not giving me. And now someone else who has not earned it and does not deserve it gets your blessing and your grace. And I am mad and I refuse to come into the celebration. I will stand out in the field with my arms crossed and um, that's exactly what is happening in this story. God, you owe me. All these years I've been slaving for you. You never even gave me a goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. And the response from the father to the older son is the same response that he gives to all of the religious rule keepers, which I have been one, and you probably have been one. Maybe, maybe you haven't. Um, son, daughter, you're always with me. Everything I have is yours. And he points him back, he points the son back to relationship with him as the end goal, as the ultimate satisfaction. We see this played out actually in another story in the New Testament. I won't read all of it for time's sake, but we see it in the story of Mary and Martha. There's two sisters and Jesus visits their house. And it says that as Jesus goes into the house, Mary's actually sitting at the feet of Jesus. And Martha, the other sister, is actually hurriedly zipping around the house making egg salad sandwiches. I don't know what she's actually making. Um, she was making some food but whatever they had. And she's making food. And uh, it says, uh, I'll, I'll read a little bit of this in uh, Luke 10, verse 40. Uh, it says in verse 39 that Mary was sitting at Jesus's feet. In verse 40, it says, but Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to Jesus and asked him, check this out, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Do you see it? It's the same thing that the older brother said. This son of yours has come back and I've been working. And I've been doing it all. And I've been slaving. And I haven't disobeyed you. And this son of yours comes back and just gets grace because it's grace. And I am mad. And Martha goes to Jesus and kind of wags her finger in his face and says, Lord, don't you care? She starts, she's angry at Jesus. She's mad at God because she's like, I've been working and they're not all working the same way. And I'm mad about it because I'm keeping a scoreboard. I've got a letter and I kept the rules and they didn't keep the rules. And here's what's fascinating is that Jesus doesn't push back against Martha for her much work, but he does push back about where her attention is first placed. He says to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about many things, but Mary 
has chosen what's better and it will not be taken from her. Now, Jesus was not saying to Martha, hey, don't worry about anything about work. Don't worry about purpose. Just seek pleasure. He wasn't saying that. What he was saying is, hey, Mary is sitting with me in relationship and that is the greater priority to doing the work. And here's what's fascinating today as we talk about be before do is that Martha was all about do and Mary was all about be. Mary was all about sitting at the feet of Jesus and receiving from him. Martha was all about making egg salad sandwiches anxiously in the kitchen and then angry at God himself because it wasn't working out the way that she wanted to control it and make it work out. And this is exactly what happens when we live our lives through the lens of religious demand. Here's what's what's interesting. Religious demand and I have this on your screen, religious demand will always lead, it always leads to relational dead ends. Religious demand always leads to relational dead ends with God, and it ends in anger and a questioning of God. It, it leaves us to a place where we're like, God, you didn't keep up your end of the bargain. I kept my end of the bargain. I've been doing all the rules. I've been working in the field. I've been making the egg salad sandwiches in the kitchen, and they all haven't been, and that's on them, and I'm mad at them, and God, it's on you, and I'm mad at you. And here's what's so fascinating is that we can seek satisfaction in life through seeking pleasure, our own personal pleasure. We can be a rebellious rule breaker. We can be a rebellious self-seeker. We can be a rebellious self-sufficient person and say, I don't need I don't need a father. I don't need God. I don't need anybody. I don't need anything. I follow my heart. I set my own path. I set my own plan. And we can pursue our own pleasure. And that leaves us in a dead end, feeding things that will never feed us, bankrupt, empty, and hungry in another country, in a distant land. Or we can seek satisfaction through purpose and keeping the rules. And we can be a religious rule keeper and we can keep score. We can do all the right things but it always ends up in a relational dead end. And here's what's here's the big takeaway. The big interesting thing from today is that both sons actually missed relationship with the father just through two different methodologies. And here's what's fascinating to me is that God is not a taker or a demander. And that's important for both both sons to realize because the younger son thought that God was keeping, that the father was keeping inheritance from him. He's like, I want my stuff. I don't want you, but I want my stuff. Give it to me. I'm going to go spend it how I want to spend it. And then the older son was like, I've been working for you, but you're not paying off very well. And they both saw God, the father as a taker, as a demander, as one who was putting something on them. But God's not a taker or a demander. God is a giver and a supplier. And he was giving and supplying to the younger son through grace the entire time. And he was giving and supplying to the older son too. And wherever they were at in their relationship toward the father, the father was consistent in his relationship back to them. And he reminded both of them, it's not about what you did. It's not about what you do. It's not about breaking the rules or keeping the rules. Those things are important, but that's not fundamentally what it's about. Fundamentally, what it's about is it's about being in relationship with the father. And that's what it's all about. I want to read this to you. It says, you can avoid God by keeping all the moral laws. That's the religious rule keeper. If you do that, then you have rights. God owes you answered prayers and a good life and a ticket to heaven when you die. You don't need a savior who pardons you by free grace for you are your own savior. And then here's another one. This one will be on your screen. It says, neither son loved the father. They both were using the father for their own ends. You can be alienated from him either by breaking the rules or by keeping all of them diligently. And here's what's so interesting is that you can be both brothers at different points in your life. You can maybe even be both brothers on the same day of your life. And I will tell you that I have lived as both brothers. I have spent at least a decade as each brother. And I will say um, that we, we, we can experience, again, both of those bad starting points. And we can be reading the Bible and we can be praying and we can have relationships in the church or out of the church. And we can be trying to do all the right things. But if we start in the wrong place, you can be talking to your father about what you see on the banner, but you're in a different part of the convention center. You're in a whole different spot. You do not know where you're starting. And so today, here's what's so interesting is that there's the rebellious self-seeker who's seeking pleasure, and there's the religious rule keeper who is steeped in purpose. But there's a third way, and it's what the father's trying to get to both brothers, and it is this. The third starting point, the third way to live is not a religious rule keeper or a rebellious self-seeker, but the third way to live is a relational son or daughter. 
a relational son or daughter, and that relational son or daughter seeks satisfaction through the gift of being in relationship with God the Father. And that is us at Element Church, and that is as we remodel and as we start to go back and say, what do we have as a foundation? Here's our foundation that our greatest pleasure and our greatest purpose in life found find perfect unity and synchronicity. I don't even know that's a word, but it is now. The perfect union together is in relational um, intimacy with God, our Father. John 1, 14, 16 and 17 says this, the word became flesh, that's Jesus, that's God manifesting to the person of Jesus, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth, grace and truth. Out of his fullness, we have received grace in the place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And intimacy is a combination of grace and truth inside of relationship. Truth is for the rebellious self-seeker. Those of us who say, I don't need any rules. I don't need anybody else. I don't need a God. I'm doing my own thing. I am self-sufficient. I've got my own thing going on. To you today, I say the Bible has a message for you, and the message is that there's truth, that, that there's a grain to the universe. And when you work against the grain of the universe, you get splinters. And you are probably, if you're if you're that person, the rebellious self-seeker, or you're self-sufficient, you've got some splinters. Well, the Bible says that you can come home Home through truth to God the Father. You can have that realization where you say, anybody living in my father's home is living better than this. And today is your day to come home. And that is for you. And then there's grace for the religious rule keeper. For those of you who are like, I've been keeping all the rules. I've been pouring myself out. I've been working my fingers to the bone and it's not working. And I'm, I'm mad at others and I'm frustrated with God. You know what? There's grace for you today because it's not about keeping all the rules. It's about being in a grace-based relationship with God, your father. And Jesus speaks to you as he spoke to Martha, 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 Martha. What you're doing is not good. Come back and be with me. That's the greater thing, and it won't be taken from Mary. And that's the invitation for you today, because God's presence is both the pleasure and purpose for God's people, and it's in re relationship with sons and daughters. And that's how we live. John 14, 18, and 20 says, I will not leave you as orphans. I'll come to you. Jesus is talking to his followers. He says, on that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you're in me, and I am in you. On that day, you will realize that the Father's good and that you can come home. So I pray today is that day where wherever you are, that you're realizing that God's calling you into an intimate relationship with him. And here's the thing. I've, I've got four. Um, I'll, I'm going to run through these very, very briefly. They're just four practicals. Four that you say, how do I do this, Pastor Scott? Like, what do we do? How do I spend time with the Father as a son or a daughter? Well, here's four quick ideas. One is you make a radical decision. And we need to make hard breaks from our present habits and rhythms. We're overcommitted. We, um, we have addiction to uh, running fast. We have um, numbing behaviors that we do. We have all sorts of rhythms and patterns in our life that keep us from being with our Father. We have to make a hard decision to break some of those. And I don't know what that is for you, but you know right now as I'm talking exactly what it is. And the Holy Spirit will help you if you'll ask him to break that to make a radical decision. Number two is you need to feel your feelings. For some of us, we're moving so fast and we have been trained and taught that it is almost unspiritual to feel what we're actually feeling. Feelings are not always the best guide for us, the best captain for us, but they are great um, road markers for us to figure out um, where we need Jesus to intervene in our life. I, I wrote it like this, feeling, feel your feelings. There are pathways to where you need Jesus to intervene. So as you go throughout a day, ask yourself the questions, why am I always in a hurry? Or why am I in Why was I impatient there? Or man, I'm feeling so much anxiety. What is all this anxiety about? Or why am I so angry? Why did I get so defensive when that person said the X, Y, Z thing about whatever I was doing? Or why do I avoid a conflict with that person over and over again? Um, they're all pathways to engagement with God, but you will not engage God in those places unless you feel your feelings. So that's the second thing. Number three is you need to, if you're going to break a hard break with your current pattern and rhythm, then you need to integrate silence. You need to create an empty space that God can come and fill. And for us, that's where we talk about soaping through the Bible, which by the way, we read the Bible together as a church. You can read it with us, download our phone app. You get the reading plan right on there. Um, or you can go to the element.church backslash next step. So you can check it out there. But we read the Bible together. We pray 
we, 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 we integrate silence and we create empty space where we can talk with God. And then number four is we commune with Jesus throughout the day. We are with Jesus. We, we be with, I know that the language is odd there. We be with Jesus before doing for him. We need to be with him before doing for him. And, and our being with Jesus needs to overflow into a supply of our doing for Jesus. And yes, calendars and appointments and events with prayer time are really important. But if you think about it like a friendship, we have calendars and appointments and events with friends that we've established, but then we also just have the text messages or just the phone calls or just seeing them at wherever we go. And it's just this ongoing relationship. And I pray that that's what we would have with God. So guys, we need to be before we do. And as we enter this season of reconstruction, of, of remodeling, I want to bring us back to the foundation because the starting point matters. The starting point matters. And in those three, I pray today you'll identify where you are and I pray that you will reorient yourself to that third place because you can be talking with God and hanging out with God, but if you don't have the right starting place, it is the difference between reading the banner and winding up in a dead end and reading the banner and finding your father. And so I wanna pray today for you. If you've been pursuing pleasure or purpose, I want to pray for both of those to be found in personal relationship with God. Let me pray over you. Father, I thank you for today. God, I pray right now, God, for all of the younger brothers, all of the younger daughters, God, all of the, 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 the sons and daughters, God, the ones that were created to be sons and daughters, but they have taken their stuff and they've left home. God, they've gone into a faraway country and this morning you are calling them home. God, not home to be a hired servant, to work their way back or to, to pay off their debt, but you're calling them home as a son or a daughter and you're calling them home right now through your grace. So I pray right now, if that's you, I pray you would come running home right now, that you would have that realization Everyone in my father's home is living better than this. And you would get up and leave the broken place, the hungry place, the place where you're feeding something that will never feed you. If that's you today and you want a relationship with God, would you just pray this prayer with me? You've never started that relationship before. You've done it, but today you need to come home. Pray this prayer with me right now. Say, God, thank you for Jesus. I believe he was your son. I believe that through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, you paid for me to come home today. And I come running home right now, and I know that as I am coming home, you are watching and waiting for me, and you will come running out to me with a new robe and fresh sandals and a new ring on my finger, and you will, we will fall and embrace, and you, God, will accept me back in, and it is an absolute party. <laughs> God, thank you for the party. Thank you for the celebration. And I pray that the self-sufficient and the self-seeker would be coming and running home today. If that's you, come running home today. If you are the religious rule keeper, I pray today that there would be a fresh and filling of grace for you. I pray right now that you would just find joy and grace, that all of that obligation and, and over um, abundance of purpose, that you would let that go, all of the work in the field, and that you would let go of the anger and the disappointment and the frustration. And you would once again, just come back to the place where you just say, Father, I just need you. I just want to be with you. I just want to come into the party and I want to celebrate with you. I pray for a fresh and filling of grace over you today, right now. I pray, God, for anyone who is holding on to unforgiveness, God, whether it's for another person or whether it's toward you, God, I pray right now that there would be a release, a break of that. And I pray, God, that as they make a decision to forgive, that there would be a fresh um, presence, God, that your spirit would come rushing in and fill them up, God, in all the places that have been dry and burdened and that you would, you, they would sense you in a fresh way today. Even now, as I'm praying and talking, they would be sensing you. And so God, I thank you for that. And then lastly, God, I pray for the sons and daughters, God, the ones that have come home and the ones that have been home as sons and daughters. But God, I pray today for a fresh pleasure and a fresh purpose, God, that it would come together in just an explosion, God, of just joy in you today, that there would be just a joy in relationship with you. And so I pray over everybody, God, all sons and daughters today that are walking with you, I pray for fresh revelation. God, I pray for fresh relationship. Relationship. God, I pray for a new and filling of your spirit. God, I pray for a fresh intimacy. And God, that, that you would breathe into the places that have been dry and weary. God, we've come out of this COVID season. God, I pray you would breathe into the places that have been tired. And I pray that you would just be stirring up your spirit in us again. God, we thank you, God, for teaching us to be before we do. And we thank you for that today. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer with us um, about receiving Jesus today, making a commitment for him, you've never done it before, you did it, but you came home today in a fresh way, would you text the keyword element to 97,000 on that form that you get? You'll click a link on the form. It says, I made a commitment for Jesus today. Click that and then uh, let us know. We'd love to hear from you. We can get you a Bible if you need one. We have something, a little fresh start book if you need one of those, but we would love to engage with you. And then we would like to invite you to be part of Element Church. Um, please come, be part of the family. We uh, you're, you're part of God's family now. Find other brothers and sisters to run with. We want to invite you to be part of Element. And uh, you can do that. You can even just go to our website, theelement.church backslash next steps, or you can just go ahead and fill out that next steps form that you're filling out. Let us know who you are. We would love to connect with you. And here's what we're going to do as we wrap up today, you guys. We're going to play a worship song today. And uh, we want to invite you to take this today, take this teaching, and actually to reflect on it as we move into a place of worship. Talk with him as we move into this place of worship and ask him, hey, God, how do I need to recalibrate my starting point with you today so that I can find you instead of hitting relational, emotional, and spiritual dead ends? Let's worship together this morning. And we'll see you guys right back here next week. We love you.